seen always and still gets to me. Um, and, and I think uh, it reveals so much about how special Gary's film is. Um, that brief, the brevity of it also uh, reveals a lot about who Gary is and, and the brevity of his, of his bio tells you a lot about um, who he is as a person and about his humility. Luckily, I get to sing his praises before he receives this most deserving uh, award. First and most importantly, Gary had the foresight to see that a film about an ambivalent writer and a homeless musician could be successful, even without car chases, explosions, and visual effects. He had the courage to fight lawyers, our own lawyers, who didn't want some of the Lamp residents to be a part of the film. And most importantly, he had the capacity to forge lasting friendships with Nathaniel Ayers and the other members of the Lamp community. Simply because he was touched by a few columns in a newspaper, we've all learned so much. We have learned the courage that it takes to sleep on the streets, how the cacophony that people feel help muffle the voices from within, and how work anchors us, whether we're paid or not. So for using the power of the media to shine light where before there was darkness and to create hope where before there was despair, Gary truly deserves this honor. So let's welcome the 2009 Beatrice Stern Media Honoree, my friend Gary Foster. Uh, wow, thank you. Thank you, Stacy. There was no better person to be here today to uh, present me with this. Uh, and I was totally surprised that Steve Lopez uh, graced uh, this, this luncheon. Um, he has become a true friend, and uh, I'm thrilled that he found the time to get, to get here today. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Keita Curry and the board of directors of DD Health, DD Hirsch uh, Mental Health Services for giving me this honor. I'm truly humbled. Um, personally, when I was asked to be a part of this event, I had no idea about the many connections my family had to uh, Dee Dee Hirsch. It turns out my mother, Jackie Foster, and Nancy Rubin, uh, Dee Dee's daughter, are old friends, and that my daughter, Kayla, drives a daily carpool to the Archer School that includes Beatrice Stern's granddaughter, Andrea. So it is certainly a small world. I am an Angelino who still believes in the daily ritual of reading the newspaper. There is nothing like the sound of the paper hitting the driveway in the early dawn. In January of 2007, as I was having my morning coffee, I happened upon Steve Lopez's column recounting how he and Nathaniel Ayers attended a Los Angeles Philharmonic rehearsal at Disney Hall. It was poignant, funny, and inspirational and I was drawn to the complexity of Steve's struggle and dogged commitment to get his friend Mr. Ayers to the event. His words not only captured my heart, but also drove my curiosity to know more. The process of making The Soloist allowed me a unique access to a world that I had truly never contemplated. Even though my extended family has experience with mental health illness, it was dealt with as a very private matter. This is not to say we didn't rally to help, of course we did. But clearly the societal stigma was a strong influence with the desire to keep things quiet. From the very beginning of the work on The Soloist, I made a point to spend time on Skid Row. I walked the streets hoping to become comfortable, at least comfortable enough, so that I could do my job effectively. For professional reasons, I wanted to immerse myself in a community that was foreign to any other I had experienced. That first solo walk was scary, had me wondering what I had gotten myself into. The streets were filled with tents and porta potties. The stench was hard to miss. I witnessed people smoking crack and shooting up. Could this be my city? I wanted to turn back, but in all the chaos, almost everyone I encountered said hello, reached out a hand, or smiled as I passed by. So I kept moving forward, pulled by some instinct that I could not at that moment understand. 
As the days progressed, my attitudes changed. I looked forward to my walks on San Julian Street. I began to recognize faces and was greeted with friendship by those I encountered. I felt compelled to know this community better. So one day, I walked into the courtyard at Lamp Community Safe Haven and sat down just amongst the crowd. I may have been dressed slightly better than most, but as far as anyone knew, I was just looking for a rest. I began to chat with people. Ironically, I felt like the odd one out. Um, as my concern of being exposed as some Hollywood producer trying to cozy up to the less fortunate drove my paranoia. But the hours of conversation rarely landed on that subject. After a few visits, my arrivals were met with a shout out and an invitation to sit down. We shared stories, sang songs, talked about the issues of our lives. While there was a social divide, there was not a humanistic one. I felt refreshingly comfortable with the community of people that only weeks before I had feared. I had an epiphany one night. I realized I knew more about the details of my new friends' lives and dreams than I did about some of my relationships in West LA. Teresa was hoping to be reunited with her kids who were in foster homes now that she had stabilized on lithium. Detroit had run from parole and was trying to regain the confidence to return to her home in Indiana and face the charges so she could get on with her life. Blind Steve, who was once a prom promising radio DJ, had hopes of reconnecting with a country music station in Los Angeles. And Danny, a world champion track star and silver, silver medalist in the 1984 Olympics, wanted a chance to pass on his knowledge as a coach. Those of us who made The Soloist had a professional responsibility to serve our partners. DreamWorks, Paramount, Participant, and Universal, the companies that funded our film, were unbelievably supportive. But we also had a responsibility to tell a truthful and authentic story about a community that is misunderstood, neglected, and usually misrepresented. Mental health illness is not something a person chooses to have. It's a medical condition, it's a disease. It's not an arrestable offense. My friends on Skid Row are no different than any of us. They are not subhuman. They are people who have dreams of success just like we do. And whether it's playing a cello or training for a job or the desire to possess a key to an apartment in permanent supportive housing, they work every day to take steps toward a better life. When we completed the film, for the first time in my career, the journey was not over. Even though we finished shooting in April of last year, I still make frequent visits, visits down to my um, friends at LAMP. My office knows to interrupt whatever I am doing if Detroit calls and needs to talk. This community and those people are, subjects, are, are not just subjects in a film, but valued friends in my life. It is my most sincere hope that the legacy of the soloist is acceptance and understanding. The story of a gifted young man whose dreams were dashed because of schizophrenia has the possibility to open eyes to the consequences of turning away from those we don't understand because of social stigma. There are thousands of Nathaniels on Skid Row, each one with a story worth listening to, each with dreams dashed but also driven by dreams of a better future. And it is my dream that people who see our film begin to consider my friends as equals and valued members of our society so next time you have a desire to go for a walk, think about a stroll downtown. You may have the opportunity to reach out a hand, receive a warm smile, and make a new friend. And in closing, I want to share with you an email that I received just last week, and I thought it was a good way to look towards the future. I'm a 14-year-old boy in San Jose, California, who went to see The Soloist with my friends today. I didn't want to see the movie, but I am so glad that I did. The moment I got home, I ran to my computer and I have been looking up stories on Mr. Ayers all day. The movie and information I found was so intriguing that I even own the book now and intend to read it myself and have my mother read it as well. I can't wait to show my family the movie and I'm making plans to take them this weekend. I get to go to work with autistic kids with my class. Yeah, so thank you. So we have one young convert 
Let's work for more. Thank you very much.